Uh, I'm now delighted to be joined by current Minister for Enterprise, uh, Simon Coveney, here at the Fine Gael Art Fest here in Galway. Uh, Minister Coveney, this is your last Art, art Fest uh, as Minister, of course. You've been in Cabinet since 2011, a, a lot to look back on. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm, in, I'm into looking forward now, you know, and uh, one of the reasons I've made the decisions I've made in the last week or so is that I want, I want Fine Gael as a party to, to bring forward new leadership, uh, to, uh, um, to renew itself uh, as we move into the election cycle, and that's going to happen under Simon Harris, and uh, so I felt by, by stepping aside I'd give him more space to, to promote talent and ambition within the party. And that's a good thing, you know. I've had I've had 13 fantastic mm. years at the centre of government through sort of extraordinary challenges at different times, yes. whether it was COVID, whether it was Brexit, whether it was the war in Ukraine, uh, whether it was the economic challenges that we had from 2011. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully, um, I've I've played a part in, in in helping to rebuild a much more resilient economy and society. Uh, and you know, and I'm going to support obviously the, uh, the the new leadership that emerges now next week. I don't know her. And um, as you said, you've held a number of different portfolios over the 13 years, but you were also Minister for, for Defence, and one of the, the big pieces of work was the Commission on Defence yes. published in, in 2022. It's a good framework, it's a good blueprint, but as your colleague Charlie Flanagan said in the session earlier on, that there needs to be more kind of speed in implementing its recommendations. Yeah, so, so for me, I think Ireland needs to invest a lot more uh, in the Defence Forces and in Defence Infrastructure more generally. Uh, this is about basic defence capacity uh, so that we can protect our way of life and our country. In truth, I think most Irish people don't feel threatened uh, in the same way that many countries to the eastern parts of the European Union do by, by Russian aggression or by other forms of aggression. But I think we need to be careful not to be naive here. Uh, you know, we are non-aligned militarily. We're not a part of NATO. So Ireland does have to have basic capacity to defend itself. And that means investing in our naval service, investing in our air corps, uh, in, investing in our army, of course, so that we can undertake peacekeeping missions around the world and making sure that they're properly equipped. Um, and in truth, that means implementing fully the recommendations of the Commission on the Future of the Defence Forces. Um, uh, and, you know, like in brass tacks, what this means is moving from spending one billion on defence to spending two billion on defence by about 2028. But actually, that should just be a stepping stone to move on to something that's um, that's better resourced post 2028. Um, now, in order to do that, of course, we have to attract a lot more people into the defence forces. Exactly. Um, so, so even if we wanted to, this isn't just about money spent. I think the government is committed to that, but it's about persuading more ambitious talented young people to join the Defence Forces in terms of Air Corps, Navy and Army um, and getting expertise in terms of cyber security and so on into the Defence Forces. All of that needs to happen and we are setting about doing that now but it'll take some time. And both Roisin and ourselves come from Kilkenny which is a proud military si uh, very city. Proud. city and Fantastic we barracks there. Yep. And we have a third battalion that's currently in um, uh, Camp, Sh Camp Shamrock and they're, yep. you know, it's, it's very difficult um, in the Middle East at the moment. What would you say to the, to the soldiers and, the fa and their families uh, at this time? Well I think they're, they're serving their country with distinction so I'd say you know my experience with the defense forces uh, in the context of peacekeeping in particular is that they are extraordinarily professional in terms of what they do uh, you know I've been to uh, to southern Lebanon uh, many times uh, to meet our defense forces there uh, I've also been to the Golan Heights to meet our defense forces there I was in Mali uh, uh, which was part of a, a training mission the Irish defense forces were part in um, so you know I've seen firsthand the value that our uh, defence forces bring to peacekeeping around the world. Um, uh, if a member of your family is there, you should be very proud of him or her, um, because in many ways, this is a form of patriotism that that not too many people are willing to uh, to uh, to deliver. Uh, and uh, we should value our defence forces and encourage more people to join. And when we talk about the defence forces, we're not just talking about our army, we're also talking about our navy, which is extremely important because we're an island nation, we need to be able to defend ourselves. We have critical you know, infrastructure. Yeah, critical in, assets, and there'll in, be a lot in, more in our seas. So, you know, yeah. so if you look at the next... Improving capacity in, in the naval yeah. services, obviously. If you look at the next really five important. to 10 to 20 years, we're going to be spending tens of billions of euros on wind farms offshore, which are going to be powering the Irish economy and Irish society into the future in a renewable way. That kind of infrastructure needs to be protected. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, and so you know, part of the Commission on the Future of the Defence Forces 
uh, is a recommendation to effectively double the number of people in our in our naval service so that we can have what's called dual crewing of ships so that people young people don't have to spend as long at sea uh, as they do today to make a career in the naval service more exciting and of course to invest in new ships uh, more modern ships that are more stable that are easier to work on um, um, again because we have to look at the quality of life yeah. for for a soldier or a sailor or an air crew um, and so the better the equipment they have I think the more likely we are to get more and more people signing up um, so I'm, I'm very confident that in the medium term our defence forces uh, is going to be in a very good state but in the short term we have a lot of challenges mainly around recruitment that we have to overcome and one of the main things of recruitment uh, <coughs> Minister Coveney is the pay and conditions and also the affordability of even being able to afford to buy a home or even rent uh, a home so that, that is really affecting the, an awful lot of the members of the Defence Forces. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's, that's a question you know, that people raise across the public sector more generally. You know, I mean, if you actually compare pay in the Irish Defence Forces with many other similar countries around the world, actually pay isn't, is, isn't that bad. But I mean, you know, soldiers should be paid, paid well. Yes. You know, and, uh, and so, you know, we are, we're constantly talking to the Defence Force representative bodies and of course the Chief of Staff about how we can improve conditions, uh, in, improve supports to make a career in the Defence Forces more rewarding, both financially and from a skills point of view. Um, you know, and I think, I think we've done a lot in the last number of years in that space. Uh, and I think we'll do more. I mean, if you look, for example, at the quality of accommodation in, in Hall Bolin, at the naval base now, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic, the new accommodation that, that, we've, that we've spent, you know, significant amounts of money on. Uh, if you look at the quality of ships now that our young uh, naval service personnel are operating on, you know, significant improvements in terms of the quality of, uh, of, of life at sea. Um, so we'll continue that journey uh, and I think it'll be, well, it's a necessary uh, uh, one. We need to succeed in terms of defence capacity and uh, Fine Gael and government I think will be the strongest advocate for that. And um, Minister Coveney, before we finish up, uh, the government that, that you're part of currently uh, with um, uh, your partners uh, Fianna Fáil and the Green Party, it has you know, at, at most uh, a, year a year to run. Yep. Um, what would you like to see? Uh, Simon Harris um, prioritise in that in that period as, as Taoiseach has in the run to generate. Well, look, I think you know, I think Simon's given some indications of that already. I think you know, in some ways, a return to the basics uh, of what people want and expect from Fine Gael. You know, law and order, uh, more policing, um, better policing, um, uh, communities feeling protected. Uh, supports for business, uh, particularly small family businesses, not just the big multinationals that are here. And you know, in the next couple of weeks, we're we're going to see quarter of a billion euros go out to 143,000 businesses across the country uh, in what's called the the increased cost of business grant scheme, which I put in place uh, to help businesses with the cost of running their businesses. Um, you know, I think Fine Gael will always be very strong supporters of education because uh, we believe that that's investing in the future. Uh, you'll see. Fine Gael also taking a very ambitious approach towards climate, uh, but also uh, talking to communities, uh, in particular the farming community, around how they can evolve and change in the context of climate pressures while at the same time staying economically sustainable too. Uh, again, I think that's something that Fine Gael is very, very vocal and strong on. So, you know, uh, enterprise, security, uh, rural Ireland as well as urban Ireland thriving and Ireland with a very strong international voice. You know, these are these are all calling cards for, for Fine Gael. Well, Mr Coveney, thanks a million for taking no the time to talk Thank here you. on the Irish Political Roundup. One last, last word to the men and women serving in uh, Camp Shamrock. What would your message be to them today? Well, my message to them is to say thank you uh, for, your, for your sacrifice, for your professionalism um, and for the quality of peacekeeping that you're continuing to provide. You know, you're working in one of the most volatile places in the world. Um, and the presence of peacekeepers prevents conflict escalating. And so the, the value of your work is significant. And, you know, we've seen, unfortunately, young Irish soldiers lose their lives in Lebanon, even, even in recent years. Uh, and so this is a serious job that involves serious risk. Uh, but I, um, you know, as a former defence minister, I am enormously proud 
uh, of the continuing role that Irish peacekeepers make right across the world, but particularly in the Middle East, uh, given what we're seeing at the moment on our televisions. Simon Coveney, thank you so much thank indeed. You. Thank no you worries. so much. Thanks a million. Now, I'd like to be joined by Finn again, TD for Carol Kilkenny. Uh, John Paul, feeling very well. He's an Irish policeman uh, from the uh, John Paul, Finn again, conference here in Finn again. Sorry, here in Galway. Um, a big, big turnout, good, good atmosphere. Um, there, there certainly is a mood of change. Yeah, there is a mood of change. I suppose everything, like the last month has been an incredible month of change. Nobody, nobody saw the Leo Varadkar retirement coming when it did, um, and you know very quickly. Obviously, Simon Harris was out of the box as a potential candidate, and then the only candidate. So, you know the old saying about a week being a long time in politics. I mean, um, that week was certainly a, a huge thing. And I suppose the conference here, the Ardesh, is a reflection of that in the sense that. There's a bit of a buzz around the place again, you know, a good crowd, even up from our own neck of woods in Carroll Kenny, we, we only at the last minute decided to run a bus and fill it. Um, so, like, there, there, there is a big crowd here in the University of Galway today. Absolutely. And um, I was speaking to your colleague, um, Simon Corbyn, there is, this looks like there's probably an opportunity to kind of reset the again as regards where it's going in, in, in this, this government, which we don't know. When the next election when we will be hopefully um uh, our people can again hope it will be later. Um mm -hmm. uh, but um what are the kind of things that you'd like to see from again for some of the during the remaining time of the time yeah. here in Rutland so. I, I think one of the biggest issues that kind of slipped off the political radar for a while was law and order. Uh, and I'm talking about public order obviously was brought to people's Tension dramatically with the riots in Dublin before Christmas, but but even in, in towns and villages across the country, that visible guard of presence, um, uh, and not not only just that, like more of a deterrent from for people committing serious offences. Um, like I won't go into the details because I don't want to get involved in individual decisions of the court. But lenient sentencing for serious offences has been a problem ongoing, particularly serious sexual and. and you know, crimes against the person, uh, offences. So I would expect in, in the next 12 months or however long it is that there will be more of a focus on, on issues like that. Obviously the big ones of health and housing haven't gone away, you know, either. Um, but I, I, I think uh, 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 regional development as well as, as, well as uh, law and order are probably the ones that we'll see a bit more activity on in the next generation. It has. Look at it, it, it is remarkable when I meet council candidates who are out canvassing at the moment uh, from very rural parts of the country where you know there aren't any say direct provision centres and immigration is the biggest issue. Um, now, what is that about? I suppose part of it is, is a, a fear of the unknown, part of it is uh, the fact that we have an immigration system that doesn't really work. You know, we we you know, we need economic migrants in Ireland to do jobs. There are certain jobs we couldn't fill without. Them. But equally, there there is a sense from some people, I think, that people who fail the process still, in many cases, get to remain in the country. And that's very unfair on, you know, any asylum process. If, if it is to be fair and just, then people who, who, who come through it remain, but the people who don't shouldn't shouldn't get the same result. Yeah, uh, okay. And I think there's a bit. I think things like that are feeding into migration. It's yeah. not just an Irish problem. It's been seen right across Europe. And Ireland has signed up to a kind of a European pact that will make it make immigration, particularly in Europe, uh, illegal immigration, more uh, robust. Yeah. Well, it's it's about ensuring like we'll never, as a small island nation, we'll never be able to solve it independently on our own. Uh, and actually, I don't, that's why I don't understand opposition to the EU-wide migration proposal. That's what it says is we're going to have a, a process in the future that will be quicker, that will have outcomes where you know those who can remain can remain and those who can't will, will be removed. I mean, it's actually a positive development, and particularly for a country like ours where you know we have a, a, a dispersed community, I suppose, across the country, and still even our population has grown relatively small population compared to the rest of the EU, I think it makes sense for migration to be dealt with at a European Union level rather 
ourselves in just us dealing with our, ourselves at the border. Like we can't have a situation now where effectively like a lot of people come to Ireland without, you know, they have no papers when they arrive in Ireland. We all know that they wouldn't be able to get on a plane if they didn't have to be in the 2004 immigration act. Exactly. And they wouldn't get on a plane, they wouldn't be able to get on a plane without our boat, without having had some papers. And it, like I feel our system at the moment actually um, kind of feeds these prime groups, these middlemen who are smuggling people effectively, um, to get them out of, in many cases, North Africa, um, and get them into European Union countries. It's very, it's unfair on, on everyone except those criminals. So that's why I think dealing with it at a European level is the right thing to do, and we should we should be fully integrated in that. And um, there have been a number of different motions passed today at the Fine Gael Conference. You spoke on, there was a motion on Fine Gael and Zopton, the Occupied ter ter Territories Bill, which, um, according to the Attorney General, is legally flawed. Um, we were quite um, yes. adamant that the Fine Gael Settlement shouldn't accept that. The problem, look, there are several problems with the legislation. First of all, not least of them, is the fact that it is illegal. Under European law, we can't do what's, what's being requested. So we shouldn't be adopting motions that are illegal anyway. My point of view is the, the legislation itself is, is couched in terms that it can refer to any part of the world where there is an ongoing conflict and where there is an occupation. But actually, when you when you read it and the implication of it, it only affects Israel, the Israel-Palestine occupation. It wouldn't affect Mr. Putin in Crimea, which is bizarre and absurd, really, to be honest. I mean, I, uh, what's going on in Gaza at the moment is horrific. Um, and I join and I really support the government in what they're doing to try and ensure that we get a ceasefire. Like, the hundred and something odd hostages who are still being held since October 7th should be released. Uh, and there certainly should, like, the, 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 the aid that needs to get in and is still being constricted and restricted. Like, the whole thing is, is, is a disaster. But the idea that it can be resolved by this one single slogan about the Occupied Territories Bill is just absurd. Yeah. The Middle East is one of the most intractable problems. Like there's been, you go back to the Crusades, yeah, yeah. there's been constant, and it will not be solved by this kind of, um, I suppose, the student union type politics yeah. that the people before Prophet and Francis Black and, and Sinn Féin engage in on this issue. Um, Israel has done, has done many, many things wrong. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that Hamas is an actual terrorist organization. And they're not just terrorists to the rest of the world, they're terrorists to their own people. Um, and like if they're prepared to build uh, military headquarters in the basements of hospitals, like that says everything we need to know about Hamas and the way they operate. So I, mean, I just think that it's a complicated issue. We, the two-state solution is the only answer. Um, but that can only happen if people get back to negotiating and talking to one another um, and stop bombing. And that's why look, this legislation shouldn't be passed and we should do everything we can to promote and there's a lot of talk about the peace process. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of talk about elections in general. Mm. We know that both of the Europeans are, are um, in nearly here. Six, 60 days time. Yeah. Um, how do you see Finnegan's process? I think they're reasonably good. Um, I'm biased in the sense I was the director of elections for Fine Gael nationally in the local elections the last time, and we had a really good day. So uh, I think one of the stories in the next local election is that Sinn Féin are going to have a really good day because they did so badly in 2019. Um, I think Sinn Féin, our Fine Gael's hope is to, is to retain what we have. I think if we look at our part of the world in, in, in County Kilkenny, uh, we're leaving uh, in the outgoing council with uh, with nine members, I think we have a reasonably good chance of holding our nine seats, um, which would be a very good result. Um, one of the things, like we've, we've several new candidates, which is difficult to get yeah. uh, in other parts of the country who are running. Um, for instance, Damien Donahue is a good example in Ferrybank. Ferrybank's the second biggest town in Kilkenny, right. and he's the only candidate running in Ferrybank. Yeah. None of the other parties, no independent, nobody is running in Ferrybank, which is amazing. It says something about where politics is that, that people maybe aren't willing to put their, themselves forward. But he's already on his second canvas of Ferrybank, so he's going, to, he's going to do well, I think, in the local election. And, they, you know, one of the other things that has surprised me presently is that, you know, our outgoing councillors are standing, you know, yeah. again. There was a, a 
fear that a lot of people will be retiring, but that hasn't. Yeah. There's been one retirement in Kilkenny and one in Carlow, but that wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary. So, yeah. so I'd, I'd be optimistic. I think that the new leadership, Simon Harris, is a different type of person than Leo Varadkar. Um, primarily different, by the way, in the sense that he is. He will be more like in the Kenny in terms of energy for the party. Like he will be seen in every corner of the country between now and the local election. He already has his plan for each county okay. when he's going to be there in advance of the local election. So that will be different. Um, but also, as we've seen with the conference, there's a new energy when a new leader takes over. And speaking of retirement, you are stepping down at the, at the next uh, general election, uh, whenever that may be. Um, when do you think? Yeah. Again, we'll have selected their, their candidates, so hopefully we'll um, no, I, There will be selection convention post the local election. Now, as to know whether that will be kind of uh, end of June, start of July, or September, I wouldn't be sure, but I would say it's, it's in that window. Um, look, there are several councillors in Kilkenny who I know are considering their options. Um, I think people are waiting and seeing maybe a bit to see how the local elections go before they make their their own intentions clear, but I like I'd be very optimistic that, that, that there certainly is not just a capability of retaining my seat, but, but of fighting for for a second for the season. Absolutely. John Paul Field, Finnegan, Sydney for Carroll McKenney. Thank you for your time. And may also say that John Paul, he may go be back for us. Uh, a large part of the reason why we're here today. Thank you for doing that. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever thought you talked about Israel, the Middle East, and uh, the third battalion is uh, the one, two, three Leaving, in, in, in um, Camp Shamrock. Yeah. My son's one of them. So what message would you have to the men and women serving from Kilkenny to, uh, to, to the men and women in the Irish Defence Forces, one, two, three battalion in Camp Shamrock? Well, I would say, first of all, we are very proud of what they do. Um, and I mean, we might, they mightn't always realise that. But even today at the conference, like so many people spoke, we had a couple of former defence uh, service members who spoke at the conference. Uh, the second thing I would say is, be, you know, be safe themselves, because no part of the region is safe. Like, while Gaza is the focus of attention, um, ongoing rocket attacks, you know, between Lebanon and, and, and Israel are daily occurrences as well. So I would say be safe, be proud. Um, and I, would, I, for one, would hope that you know, we can continue into the future. I know that there's a, a little hiatus kind of plan for some of our uh, interventions in, in that part of the world, but I, I hope it's only a brief one because the Irish forces have done a power of good over years in, in, in Camp Shamrock and that, that whole region. Another question. The referendum. We just had the referendum. Fine Gael got it so wrong. Well, if you look at the, 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 the exit polls, the Fine Gael declared people were more or less 50-50 uh, between yes and no. What was interesting was I mean, if all figures were hugely lopsided, um, Sinn Féin figures were hugely lopsided. So I would say like we did a reasonable... What I found during the course of the campaign is the Taoiseach himself and others in Fine Gael were, were, were doing a lot of media stuff, but I didn't see much of the Minister for Integration who was the person who promoted both pieces piece of legislation. Remarkably, yes. remarkably, he didn't even show up for the declaration of the result in Dublin Castle, which, no. which, as a former minister for electoral issues, was a dramatic snub. It wasn't really covered in the media at all afterwards. But, like, you know, we all have a duty, whether you win, lose, or draw, that you show up. Um, but I think it was symptomatic of a lacklustre performance by the Green Party in particular. But uh, I, I wouldn't, I equally wouldn't read. I think sometimes we can read too much into referendumism. Uh -huh. no, I think the people decided, the people that I spoke to, that these were referendums that essentially were about language, not really about making too, too much of a change either way. And they were about updating the language in the, in the Constitution. And people just decided, well, you know, maybe this is an issue I can give the government kick on, or I can, you know, voice my dissatisfaction on about other things. On. So I, I, I wouldn't necessarily read a lot into them. But I do think for individual parties, in terms of motivating their own support base, there was indications from the results um, that wouldn't have been positive for those parties. And the other thing, actually, what I found really interesting was the reaction. Like, people will remember a number of years ago, the government at the time, with Enda Kenny's t-shirt, lost a referendum on 
oh, it was the Oireachtas Committee's powers for investigation. And then the Kenny came out and he said, we got a snap today, or we got a... And people kind of laughed at it at the time, but he took it on the chin, you know. Um, like Mary Lou MacDonald was out the day of the pound, giving out, and, and she had supported the Jura Flora, giving out about, you know, um, the government's lack of effort. I didn't see any Sinn Féin candidates around my part of uh, the country during, during the election. Whereas, in fairness, Leo Bradford was out a bit like Andy Kenny and said, look, the people voted the other way. And, like, for Democrats, then you have to believe, like, and the votes were clear. The people voted strongly the other way, because I just think, in the end, they, they, they decided that both referendums, you know, weren't worth having, because they were just effectively about wording rather than about the underlying meaning, you know? And what about the hate speech bill that, that's oh. coming up? I know, I have no to No, um, Look, it's in the programme for government, so I don't think we're going to see it drop. But as we were saying to Paul earlier on, like, this government's time is running down. And where will the focus department of this is a Department of Justice piece of legislation? So more than half the legislation that goes through the Oireachtas is Department of Justice. So they're very limited. They're, they have a very regimented timetable. So if the shift of the government focus goes to things like minimum mandatory sentencing and you know, minimum tariffs, I should say, then I'm wondering will the Department of Justice have as much time to do the changes that are necessary to behave. The idea of hate speech legislation, most people actually fundamentally have no problems. But when you look, a bit like the Occupied Territories, but when you look at the wording and the potential implications for stuff that you might have had on your hard drive from years ago that you mightn't even necessarily agree with, but could potentially, could potentially fall foul of what was originally proposed. Um, I think that has provoked a response from the, from the general public that people didn't see coming. Unforeseen consequences, I suppose. So, I, I would think that the hate speech legislation be interesting when we get the list of the upcoming government legislation. Where would it feature on that? Well, John Paul Freeland, thank you so much indeed. I, this I used to look around up, really came back. It's down to you from many years ago. <laughs> I've been a uh, part of my dissertation for IT Carlo, so yeah. thank you so much no indeed. Problem. No problem at no. all. And I'm now delighted to be joined by Maria Walsh, who's current uh, Fine Gael, uh, MEP for Ireland Northwest, my Midlands, Midlands Northwest. Midlands Northwest. Midlands Northwest. Midlands I, Midlands. I, I, I was, I, I was close. Right. Exactly. Um, you're running for election on the seventh of June. Um, how have you found the last five years in in Europe, and what are what are the goals for the for the new term if if you're hopefully re-elected? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine five years ago. Uh, where I was a new candidate, uh, trying to introduce people and remind people as a Rosa Chile, we have a lot of different qualifications and we're well able to go and communicate and love working for people and with people. Uh, five years on, I would hope people see that track record. Um, Pro-European, hardworking, believe in progressing Ireland, which is our most west periphery of the European Union. Bear in mind, 70% of legislation there, thereabouts. Yeah. What we work on in the EU impacts this country. So from my side, that continued track record is needed on not just uh, the, the development of the next common agricultural policy, which takes 30% of our EU budget, but also SMEs, our small, uh, small businesses that are in rural Ireland, predominantly run by women. Uh, as a young trained farmer, it's incredibly important for me uh, to make sure ring fence funding uh, is there and there for them. Um, and then finally, while we're running through this quickly, I could be here all day and every day talking to things about done and, and what I aim to do. But one thing that has remained consistent these past five years and will be consistent for the next five, should I be elected, uh, is my work on mental health and the fact that we need to have a dedicated EU mental health, mental health strategy. And we have the blueprint because with COVID-19 pandemic, all member states working together, there's no reason why we cannot eradicate the high statistics and horrific loss of life from mental health. Absolutely. And being in the European Parliament, it's very, very different to being in a national parliament. Please. It's, you know, you're you're in a big block, you know, and that block can be quite big. And sometimes you're you can be a small voice in in a in a big block. But how how have you found found being being part of that? And obviously you you've had um, you've been able to kind of make some inroads, particularly in the area of mental health. Yeah, a lot of people assume because we're a small member state with 13 MEPs currently, but moving to 15, uh, 14, sorry, in, in the next election, that we're too small of a country to throw our weight against the likes of Germany and France. And that couldn't be further from the truth. 
I know in the European Parliament, to your point, very different from national and local politics. You have to work right across the house. You have to, your, your, your friends and allies have to come from various groups. So while we have different, perhaps, values and motivations and different policies, the sentiment of working with pro-Europeans remains the same. And for me, uh, we as a country, we as Fine Gael MEPs have been bridge builders, have been common sense negotiators, uh, and may that long continue. Yeah, exactly. And we're at Fine Gael Ardfesh here, Simon Harris's first, um, first Ardfesh uh, as leader. What what do you hope he can he can bring to to the Fine Gael in their in the remaining time they have in government? Yeah, well, I have to say, listen, I, I, the Minister Simon Harris, party party leader, Keisha in waiting, um, is has very much been handed the reins by uh, a very pro-European, hard-working Taoiseach in Leo Varadkar. Uh, he's re-energised the party, though, even in these last couple of days. Um, you're hearing the buzz. You're hearing some former. Uh, representatives come back into the fold. You're hearing new representatives putting their hands forward. That energy is needed, particularly when we're 60 odd days out from locals and Europeans on June 7th. And it's all about Simon now, him setting out his values and priorities as, as a party and absolutely going hell for leather to get as many people elected yeah. on June 7th. Absolutely. And just, Sorry, and just, yeah. and just one point before, before we finish um, the referendum that took place. Yeah. Um, you know, it was fairly. The government they did looks like they, they got they got it pretty wrong. Nearly seventy percent against. You know, do you feel that the women's council is is representing women fully? Well, at that point, uh, at that point, the very much the women's council uh, was driving from their their membership base. Uh, and for me, it was incredibly important. Listen, I voted yes, yes. I I, I was disappointed not not both didn't cross. I can understand. Uh, where people feel those sentiments that they weren't listened to. Now we're in, as Simon Harris said, that listening mode, making sure we're getting back to people and hearing from them. Uh, but I'm a big champion of the work National Women's Council did, was putting things like gender-based violence, equal pay on the agenda long before us public representatives were given their fair due. So I have to give good credit to, to them. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. You now, now delighted to be joined by uh, Councillor Jerry Coyle. He's a Fine Gael councillor in... Mayo, but you have a very, very storied history, and your father, uh, Henry Coyle, he is a forgotten freedom fighter. My father was uh, a gun runner for Michael Collins uh, for many years until he was caught. He was one of the very few people that was jailed in Ireland for his IRA activities when he went to prevent an eviction. He was then appointed as the chief gun runner out of Scotland for Michael Collins. They drove carloads of jelly night and everything down to Liverpool. It was taken across and brought over here by a man named Neil Kerr, who was an also forgotten freedom fighter. Neil Kerr was a genius of a man. And the, the Sunday, the Saturday night after the Black and Tans killed the people in Crow Park, they burned 18 warehouses in Liverpool wow. in retaliation. And two sisters from Cork, who were also forgotten, Sheila and Kathleen Brown, bought all the paraffin that was used to burn the warehouses. You know, it's a sad tale, but it's a tale of... Um, you know, what can you say? His first wedding, he was married first in Scotland on the 22nd of June, 1922. Yeah, and for, uh, for our viewers, there's cut out from... He was married in Scotland uh, first, and his first wife died having their second baby. And it was, the, it featured on the New York Times because it was the first time the Irish Army uniform was worn outside Ireland. Wow. Two days after that, the civil war started in Ireland, and he came back and he fought with the Free State... And uh, he, he fought with them. There's actually a bullet mark there on his cheek that you can see. Oh, wow. And his, his left hand has a bandage on it. So it's a long and sad tale. But as I said, I wrote a book about it. It's called Henry Coyle, The Forgotten Freedom Fighter. But it also remembers all the great men and women that was forgotten after the struggle was over. And the, the, um, through my research, I was shocked at the way some of these people were treated afterwards, more so the women. Whatever way the, the men were treated, the women were completely mistreated. They didn't get their rightful dues from the state or their rightful pensions. And it was sad, but I have tried to remember as many of them as I can. The people that I came across, you know, great people, done great things for Ireland. But I think it's forgotten what these people achieved. You had untrained and inexperienced soldiers brought the might of the British Empire to the negotiating table. The negotiations took place by untrained and inexperienced negotiators on our side. Yeah. I think the question should have been how they got so much, not that they didn't get it all. Yeah. Because if we look back today with a hundred years of hindsight, 
with the might of America behind us, the might of Europe behind us, we can't solve the Northern Protocol, which is about paperwork, nothing to do with territory. Yeah. And I think we should also reflect on the fact that in what was called the Troubles in later years, killed 3,200 people, but the border never moved a millimetre up or down since that treaty yeah. was signed in 1922. Absolutely. And um, did your, your dad, did he, did he talk about uh, this uh, growing, growing up? I was or? 63 when I was born. Okay. So he was 70 when I got an arm. But when I was 14, I realised his story was different than everybody else's story, so I started taping him on an old tape recorder. We came from a very impoverished background. He came from a... He was over in Scotland himself, picking potatoes on the potato fields in Scotland when he was 13 and 14 years old. He came back to another life of poverty. As well as that, as well as all this you see here, yeah. he's the only man that ever was or ever will be debarred from the dog. Wow. So that's some story. So when you put it all together, he's definitely a forgotten breed of vital, a forgotten Irish hero, mistreated... That's my view. He barred from the doll, so was he... He was he barred from the doll because he was like Michael Collins. He was a 32-county Republican, okay. and he differed greatly with Cosgrove and O'Higgins. Okay. And I think the work for was gone, and he cashed some checks that whoever was supposed to back them up didn't back them up. He was declared bankrupt and lost his doll seat. All that has changed now. And ironically enough, yeah. he was prosecuted for the, the offence. And ironically enough, how ironic is this? In the great free state we had that the charges in Scotland for processing guns and ammunition was used against him in a court in Ireland. Wow. So it's all in the book. I, Henry Coyne, the Forgotten Freedom Fighter. It's a strange and sad story, but uh, we had a wonderful mother. She was 21 years younger than him, and we got a great upbringing. I never once heard the word depression, anxiety, or stress in our house when I was young. After all, he went through. But we, he, there was nine of us. His first wife died, as I said, having their second baby. And then her people wanted to take the child off him because, in fairness, he was a terrorist to them because she was a Scottish woman and they didn't know why their daughter had a baby with this fella or married to this fella. So it's all, it's a sad, long tale, but it's a, it's a good tale. Absolutely. And Jerry, you're also a, a Fine Gael councillor in Mayo. How long have you been a member of Mayo County Council? Since 1999. Elected by some to represent all. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> that's what I say. And uh, I, 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 I say that, yeah. That's my sign. That's what I say. Elected by some to represent all. It's a, it's, it's a good good slogan because not only do you represent those that voted for you, you also represent those that didn't. You have to because there's people out there that never vote for me, but they come to me with their troubles and I will try and help them. And any politician that doesn't do that shouldn't be in politics Great. because you've got to represent everybody. You've got to represent the people. You're representing an area, not people, and you're trying to do the best for the area you represent. And there's loads of different factions in that. And um, and we're also at um, the Fine Gael Art Fest. There's a new leader coming in, Simon Harris. He's going to be elected Taoiseach on, on Thursday. Well, how do you think the, the party is going to well, I'd have deal known, with that? Uh, I'd have known Indy Kinney very well, great Mayo man. I know Leo very well, and I know Simon how the party will deal with that. The party has a good story to tell because it's full employment in the country. We have a problem with the housing, but that a lot of that goes back to the COVID because they should never have stopped the housing building in the COVID times. I think that was a wrong move, but they made great decisions in COVID. But the country is at full employment, and I think what people know, I see a lot of other parties saying they need change. There's a sign on the counter when you go in, check your change before you leave the counter. Yeah. And everybody should do that before they go out and think, we want, what do you want to change? Do you want to change full employment? Do you want, what exactly do you want to change? Yeah. You know, if, if, if three people goes out to dig a drain, if I go out with two other people and I dig a drain and I dig 100 metres of a drain, I deserve more than the man that will only dig 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And both of us deserve more than the man that won't dig at all, but is as capable of us as digging, yeah. but will tell us how to dig. We both deserve more, and that's the way life is, and that's the way it has to be. It's interesting. And your book, Henry Coyle, uh, yeah, I've forgotten free and and anyone that wants it, it's in bookshops, it's in buy the book, mayobooks.ie, and uh, it's a sad and good tale, but look at, let people make up their own mind when they read it. But I've got, I've got letters and cards from around the world from people that has read it. Well, Jerry, thanks a million for taking the time to talk to us here on the Irish Political Roundup, and we wish you every success no, with the local elections in June. Thank you. 
Hello and welcome to Copy of Women Ireland and I'm out and about here in Galway and I've met this lovely lady, Martha Begley Shade, and has written beautiful books on Galway fairy tales. Martha, tell us about your books. I have ten books in total and each and every story has a message for a child on different difficult topics that children go through, like bullying, friendships, kindness, teamwork. Finding your source of good advice in life. Persevering as a friend, the importance of saying sorry I was wrong, including others that are different, all the way down to anxiety. And there are light-hearted entertaining and educational stories that children love. And especially grandparents and teachers love to tell these stories. Um, because at the end of every story, I have a discussion list as well that actually helps uh, discuss the topics after. Children. Um, and that's the whole purpose. It's all about nurturing children's well-being through using Irish storytelling. It's going back to where we were. Back to back to storytelling. Back to storytelling. The old storytelling. Sitting down like the Shana Key. Am I pronouncing that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Wow. And tell me, what inspired you? Are, are you an author? Uh, uh, no, actually, I'm an engineer. engineer. You're an engineer. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, but I started this about four years ago, and I, it started off as a bit of a hobby. Uh, but the resonance and the reaction to the topics, the reaction to things, people kept coming to me asking me for more topics. Um, it's just taken over, so now it's a fully fledged business. And I'm here with my son, Keelan. Oh, oh and a son called Keelan as well. It is, yes. No. So Keelan is the main um, guy in the, in the business. He helps me set it all up. Uh, so I have ten books. There's five with fairies, five with animal stories, and you can get them in different varieties. Single books, compilation books with five books in one, or soon I've actually just recently come out of a sound studio where I have done audio versions of the books. So I'm very excited to see those coming on board. Well, Martha, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you because I just think it's beautiful. It's about the real Irish stories, golden stories, back to the Shannon, time to the Shannon Key, telling those stories that our grandmothers and great grandmothers told us and the fairy tales. I'd love to have you on again on the Irish, uh, on, I'd love to have you on again on the um, Company of Women Island YouTube channel and tell us more about your books. I'd love that, yeah, I would, because it's so important. This is the thing that keeps me going. It's the idea that out there are children who will benefit from these stories. And it's our responsibility as adults to give back what we've learned. I mean, we've had a tough getting this far. So we've made all the mistakes, and we've learned from the mistakes. The least we can do is actually turn around and help children do it faster. And the younger you start, the children, the better it is. Because what you learn as a child stays with you all your life. That's right. I'm, you know, I remember my mother sitting down with my sister and myself every night on the stairs reading our poems. Yes. And the story, telling the story before we on the stairs, not yeah. in the bed, but on the stairs, on the way up to bed. There's so many advantages. Like, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're telling or talking to a child, you're increasing their ability to listen. They're increasing their vocabulary, their verbal reasoning, their spatial thinking, their, their ability to understand concepts, and the ability to problem solve. You know, you, there's no downside to storytelling. It's actually just a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. I had one grandmother, I have to allow me to tell the story. There's a grandmother who came to me and she bought one series of books, and from there she went home and invited all the grandchildren come to our house and they sat down together with the children and they did the storytelling um, every Tuesday night at half past seven and the children got pizza and food and Fanta but with no devices and they sat down and they talked about the story and they did that for five Tuesdays, five weeks and she said it was the best bonding that, um, and family activity which could ever have thought about. So that's it. I love to think, I love that I think we have, I have had some ten doctor parts, you know, so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. You're bringing back that special bond uh, and relationship with grandmother, telling the grandchildren fairy tales of Galway and of Ireland. Yeah.
Thank you so much indeed.